And we are excited to launch the live Tech Talks with SAP on our global SAP YouTube channel. Today's topic is managing security risks in times of change. My name is Larissa Brinkman from the SAP User Groups Organization, and I'm your moderator. If you are not familiar with SAP, we are the world's largest provider of enterprise software, and our customers generate around 87% of all global commerce. The topic of security is really important to us as SAP is a trusted partner and software provider on the customer side. Let me give you a little background for the session today. As many of you know, cybersecurity has become a mission critical issue for many organizations globally. In recent years, we have seen a significant number of malware attacks data breaches and fraud that have resulted in real financial and non-financial losses. On the other hand, we have also seen an increase in compliance regulations as a protective measure. Add to that climate change, geopolitical uncertainty, technology disruptions, digital transformation at all levels and talent shortages and you understand the complex environment we are all face. In particular, managing security risks while fulfilling compliance is a challenge for organizations around the world. In today's session, our speaker, Jay Toden van Welsen, strategic advisor to the Chief Security Officer at SAP, will share SAP's strategic approach to managing security risks and ensuring secure cloud operations. With this, over to you, Jay. Thank you so much, Larissa, for that introduction. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I'm, of course, just a spokesman here for a much larger uh, group of colleagues, um, the hundreds of people in SAP Global uh, Security and Cloud Compliance, as well as the thousands with uh, full-time or part-time security roles uh, and compliance roles in the organization. And I'm happy today to lift up a little bit of the veal of how we approach security and compliance risk and manifest that into um, better running um, as more secure and compliant landscapes. What I'm always amazed by for um, as long as I've been with SAP, which is you know, multiple, multiple years now, is what our customers do to make the world run, right? Like uh, our customers grow things, our customers uh, make things, they move things, uh, they uh, provide us with housing, um, with the things inside of our houses, uh, our transportation, the food on our table, uh, the government services uh, that we may rely on, um, teach our children, um, get us um, on vacation and visiting family, wherever they may be around uh, uh, the world. That's you know an amazing thing to me. And we believe strongly that uh, we have a role to play, not just as a solution and application provider to uh, facilitate that, but that we also um, have an obligation to make that as secure and compliant as possible and enable our customers to run more secure and compliant. As a result, we manage security risk across a wide area that we'll, we'll uh, cover a good part of. And of course, we have to navigate the various regulations that uh, we have to comply with and our customers have to comply with around the globe where the, that may be. The primary goal, of course, is for us as a uh, producer of uh, enterprise software and cloud solutions is to develop secure and compliance products that our customers can trust. And as we increasingly run um, services for our customers in the cloud, uh, that only becomes more important. We also have to realize that we are living in very uncertain times with a lot of change uh, that affects us all in some aspect or another. Uh, the last couple of years have seen an uncertain geopolitical situation um, that often is related to the client emergency, uh, whether that goes from COVID to 
um, floods, fires, droughts um, that have either rerouted uh, supply chains or have moved manufacturing. Um, there's an, an enormous transformation going on as the world gets you know, more separated and multipolar in many respects uh, and sanctions regimes come and go as well. We are also seeing increasing cyber threats, uh, including the risk of ransomware. Uh, last year saw another rise in ransomware incidents uh, globally that have been reported. Uh, and we also see that the um, um, ransoms themselves are going up. Uh, partially as a result of this, there's also a stricter regulatory climate in um, cybersecurity with especially North America and uh, EU have gotten a lot of attention for uh, uh, whether that's the uh, White House national cybersecurity strategy or EU regulation around like NIST II, DORA and um, the Cyber Resiliency Act that uh, certainly t in spirit bring uh, uh, this, the, the, the sense that vendors have a are better positioned than customers to ensure that uh, landscapes uh, systems um, are secure and uh, compliant. Uh, and that is a stance that we have long supported. We are also all going through a digital and cloud transformation. Our customers, just as ourselves, maybe uh, a little bit faster in uh, some respect. But all of that brings new changes, uh, move to cloud, move to Kubernetes, microservices-based um, workloads, but also, of course, the um, rise of generative AI uh, since last year uh, that poses new security questions, uh, uh, challenges, as well as uh, new standards and regulations. SAP takes a broad approach to that, and you know, as uh, cybersecurity and is gen is really the business of managing security risks, uh, is that we take a, um, a quantitative risk management approach to risk management. So we've adopted the FAIR methodology several years ago, um, and that allows us to translate. Uh, cybersecurity risk into financial risk, uh, including um, how a particular uh, investment uh, or effort in the organization might drive down that risk uh, and any residual risk that remains, uh, which really helps also translate uh, security risk into terms that our business executives can understand, can flow into our enterprise risk management um, but that can also help determine whether a certain investment is appropriately spent and really brings down risk. We've also adopted the NIST cybersecurity framework um, uh, several years ago uh, on the 1.1 version. Uh, we have been involved in um, uh, the 2.0 uh, feedback rounds as well and are in fact prepared to make that transition, uh, we will do that officially after a third-party assessment planned uh, later this year. Uh, and that also dr uh, drifts into the governmental and standard body partnerships uh, that we have with uh, governments around the globe. As I mentioned, we are uh, in spirit behind uh, the intent of the EU and the White House and other similar regulation going through uh, uh, different parliaments and um, uh, law bodies, regulators to uh, help make sure that the what is ultimately uh, done also is practical and achievable and um, provide that industry um, uh, expertise to make sure that we do this right and make sure that everybody's safer. Um, we uh, through our risk management, uh, the standard bodies that uh, we work through as well as any uh, audit requirements uh, all flow into our security policy framework as well as our uh, governance that we will talk about a little bit later. 
so that we can provide one policy that applies to everybody in the organization uh, development as well as beyond that uh, to make sure that we don't have to do different things for different countries so think of our security policies generally as a a, a superset of uh, all the uh, various regulatory requirements, uh, standards, and good security practices, uh, so that we only have to do this once. Uh, we uh, run also make sure that we run internal audits to make sure that um, we comply with the policies that we set for ourselves, also attested to by um, um, third-party audits every six months uh, to make sure that uh, third parties also um, attest that we do the things that we're supposed to do. Another big uh, thing that we're doing and has been very successful in gaining greater visibility and greater um, uh, compliance across the organization is the use of central and federated security services that we provide across the organization uh, from developer tooling to um, global vulnerability scans, uh, central SIEM data detection platforms, et cetera, to facilitate um, uh, the development of uh, our software and services, as well as uh, take some of the burden away from uh, developer teams so they can focus on the things that uh, they're good at. That gets us into our secure software development and operations lifecycle, which also includes product security standards and uh, hardening procedures for infrastructure and operating systems and uh, so on. So this uh, has security controls baked in from uh, code scans through uh, development security scans, uh, threat modeling, um, security validation and penetration tests uh, before a release is even uh, approved for deployment, as well as post-deployment uh, scans such as our vulnerability scans and our cloud configuration management, where we collect data, scan the landscape centrally, collect the data, uh, enrich it with uh, metadata information and asset ownership information from our asset inventory um, system so that can distribute it to those that are responsible um, to correct it and make sure that they um, do so um, to SLA. Uh, these central services also um, involve our threat detection and security incident response, so that is managed uh, centrally. Uh, we federate out uh, the threat detection also to uh, lines of businesses that have the capability to do so as uh, they often have a better understanding of their landscape um, as a central security team when it comes to the specifics of their application but the uh, central uh, operating system infrastructure uh, configuration scans uh, can be handled uh, centrally and flow into a security incident response um, uh, organization that then can marshal the resources necessary to react to that um, and get the right people uh, to make sure that it's fixed and the long-term remediation is put in place. We also focus on cyber resilience and recovery. It's not just a question of uh, protecting the landscape and detecting that something is, goes wrong, but also how can you withstand a cyber uh, attack and for how long, and in case of a, a significant uh, incident, can you recover uh, quickly? That relies on a, a large organization collaboration across the, uh, the company, the use of uh, central security services, again, for immutable storage, uh, to get that up as, as soon as possible, as, including business continuity plans and so on. All of that needs to be done within the context of a secure company. So this covers uh, a more traditional corporate IT, our laptops, our phones, our uh, corporate identities, as well as the physical security of our data centers, offices, um, uh, personnel, uh, events, 
and employees while traveling, as well as our insider threat uh, program, um, because you know, with 110,000 employees, uh, we have to be vigilant um, at all levels. Of course, uh, our, as I said, our primary responsibility is uh, enabling our customers to run more securely. So um, that comes, of course, with the secure um, uh, products that come through the uh, software development and operations lifecycle, whether that's for on-premise software or for the cloud. Um, we take a secure by default and secure by design uh, approach. Uh, we also uh, have a number of security and GOC products in our product portfolio that uh, help our customers to manage uh, the version and uh, security patches needed for uh, their landscape, as well as alert on any misconfigurations uh, or overprivileged accounts that may happen in the landscape or any particular uh, threats. That is also supplemented through our partner uh, ecosystems in uh, this area uh, that we are happy to work with and also often uh, are the ones that give us um, notice of any issues that they find in the product so that we can um, fix them and get security notes out on our next uh, Tuesday patch day. It is, of course, not enough to um, uh, scan and uh, 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 get intelligence about the landscape. We also need to make sure that the organization actually responds to that. Um, so that covers our governance and accountability. We have a number of technical controls, uh, for instance, our cloud guardrails that enforce uh, encryption standards, um, uh, block admin ports or put MFA on our cloud admins, but it also goes for our corporate infrastructure, uh, including our laptops that at some point simply will force a, um, uh, an OS uh, update um, or risk being excluded from uh, the network, for instance. Uh, for things that are a little bit harder to do and cannot be technically enforced, uh, we built up uh, a large number of organizational institutions for accountability and oversight that covers, of course, our uh, compliance organizations, but also the distribution and tracking of uh, security alerts, whether these are misconfigurations or vulnerabilities to make sure that teams actually not only have the um, alerts in hand to remediate, but also that the entire organizational hierarchy understands that this is important, that there's KPIs associated with that, um, that there are um, regular um, uh, alignment meetings, whether weekly on a more operational level, monthly, um, a level up and quarterly on um, a business unit leader level uh, with the respective uh, business information security officer, um, as well as our risk and exception uh, processes centrally um, managed risks over a particular thresholds are hand handled centrally, uh, below are handled within the business unit. I can assure you that that uh, threshold is quite low. And of course, exception management to make sure that every time that there's a deviation to a particular policy, um, that there's a remediation plan in place, um, a set of compensating controls. And if it is something that is structural, if necessary, even update the policy to accommodate for that particular use case. Uh, a big aspect as well is the security awareness uh, and education through the organization uh, to make sure that when people get their alerts and their managers are aware that they also know what to do, what their responsibilities are. Uh, that goes across the entire organization uh, from mandatory um, uh, fundamental security fundamentals training that everybody uh, in SAP has to do as well as, as the users, as uh, contractors. And um, continuous learning, role-based learning 
depending on the function that you fulfill in the organization, whether that may be in development or in an operational role uh, or in any other function of the organization. We are very proud of our early development uh, talent program. It was also referenced in uh, the US White House uh, cybersecurity talent uh, strategy and skills strategy. Um, we believe largely because we're also fairly unique, we operate across uh, four public cloud um, providers and our own cloud, uh, we have a large variety in um, of solutions uh, running on and including our uh, BPP platform that is in many respects uh, unique to SAP. So it's um, natural that we look for talent rather than um, skill necessarily um, and grow that talent in the organization uh, through this early talent program, but also continuous learning. A key aspect as well to that is a commitment to diversity and quality and inclusion. Uh, we've been very successful looking into uh, communities that in the past may have been overlooked um, when it comes to security roles. Uh, and uh, we're very happy to provide a, um, uh, both the learning as well as the uh, expertise gained simply by working in this environment um, uh, to grow the cybersecurity talent uh, around the globe. We do this also through uh, security events, talks and community. We uh, run uh, several security summits um, in uh, different, uh, at different labs uh, that uh, give security talent the chance to talk about the things that they do that they've research and the challenges that they overcome, uh, as well as bring in stories from other parts of the organization. Uh, we run a busy October Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and we have various uh, communities of practice uh, through the organization, whether it's for um, uh, uh, cloud security or um, uh, our security education talks every Thursday. Uh, I should also mention uh, our um, CTF program. Um, this is something that's built in house and is a big engager of the community, uh, brings in thousands together, um, working through quite often very um, uh, difficult challenges. It's been long since I've been able to con complete that, yet we always have good 20, 30 that managed to uh, get the whole thing done. Uh, but what's even better is the community that's grown around that and um, it brings in talent that uh, ultimately have even changed career into a security direction uh, after participating in the event. I'd like to close um, with a little back history of going about five to 10 years back, essentially. Um, in Before 2018, or around 2018, SAP was uh, primarily an on-premise uh, software provider. We had cloud services, but many ran in um, uh, our own data centers or colos. Um, and our primary function was to uh, run a secure development program to make sure that the software that uh, we released was secure and compliant. Of course, there was a corporate IT um, security function associated with that as well, but we were part of the CTO organization, um, primarily to support the uh, security and compliance of the uh, software that we release. Um, that changed in uh, the beginning of 2019 with the coming of uh, our previous uh, chief security officer, Tim McKnight. Uh, with the um, move to the CFO at the time um, to establish security risk, uh, to establish a security risk management program, essentially the uh, what we went over in the beginning uh, around the fair uh, quantitative uh, risk management methodology to feed that into our enterprise risk management and um, 
uh, also started the adoption of the NEST cybersecurity framework um, across the different functions to make sure that we cover um, all the areas appropriately and allow us to measure how we do in each of these areas. Um, as we progressed, and uh, you may also recall that at the end uh, of 2020, uh, we announced the uh, Next Generation Cloud uh, Delivery Program. Uh, security moved under the CEO um, to really make sure that security was established as an executive board priority. And um, we certainly um, uh, achieved that, uh, I think, well, we recognize that many organizations are still struggling uh, to get perhaps the right attention from their executive board. That is not a problem in SEP um, with a very strong engagement from both our executive and supervisory board. And when that goal is achieved, um, then the question mostly become of how can the organization be most effective? Our uh, goal in the leadership change in uh, the um, uh, October 2023 was to embed security and compliance even deeper into um, engineering and operations than it uh, currently does. And for that, uh, it actually is very beneficial to be part of um, uh, the CTO organization that also governs our um, platform uh, organization so that we can really build that at all points in the solutions and get to a situation where landscapes essentially become self-describing. Um, with that, we also changed the name to SAP Global Security and Cloud Compliance to show the significance of uh, cloud compliance uh, to the organization. Uh, this organization is co-led uh, by uh, Mariella Ermann as a security risk, uh, chief security risk and compliance officer and uh, Sebastian Lange, chief security officer, um, to collaborate jointly, making sure that this is a key aspect, um, uh, knowing how important it is to our customers as uh, to ourselves as a um, significant cloud service provider. And with that, um, Larissa, I'm happy to take any uh, questions that may have come in. Okay, thanks you, uh, Jay. Thank you for your presentation and bringing up all these various aspects that belong to secure cloud operations. Because uh, what we have just heard in your presentation is not just uh, solely one aspect is really a combination of various uh, things coming together and hopefully also working together in a very uh, har harmonized way. So let me check the chat. Um, I have here the first question is, is sending security and compliance reports to the CTO not a step backwards from reporting to the CEO? And how do you guarantee you get the right attention? Right. So like, let's like drop back to this slide real quick. And I touched on it already, right? So um, the purpose of uh, the move of SAP Global Security at the time uh, to move uh, uh, under the office of the CT CEO was to establish security as an executive board priority and everybody understood that, right? Uh, two years later, that was so well established, right? Like if you're... Um, uh, if every single board area, whether it's covering customer success or marketing or global finance and administration, rather than maybe the more predictable solution areas, right? If everybody's already convinced that this is a, a key priority that must be taken into account, right? That the important uh, things are security, compliance, availability, AI, then I think we're there, right? Like there's no more convincing necessary. The purpose of you know trying to get 
onto the board or get the attention from the board is to get that attention. If you already have that attention, then it becomes about how can you be most effective. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, being part of the uh, technology and innovation organization, part of the organization uh, that has the um, key platform uh, that our uh, solutions integrate through and increasingly are uh, built upon is the most effective way to actually make sure that that uh, security and compliance is literally in the product, in the operations itself. I hope that right. comes across. Right. Thank you for that. Um, there is one more question coming in. Uh, we do not have the number of resources you can bring uh, to bear the cybersecurity. What would you recommend to focus on, especially if the organization doesn't have so much uh, cap um, capacity to have so many people to do this job? Yeah, no, I, I completely understand. In my own conversations with customers, I come across this as well. I have talked to security teams that have 25 people. And those are large organizations with big responsibilities. Um, for an organization like SAP, that's quite unique and has the resources to do so, a managed service provider doesn't make that much sense. But if you're short of resources, Right, like those are exactly the type of areas um, uh, that you could think of, right? A managed security service provider or a service provider that takes a, a care of a lot of the security responsibilities uh, that you otherwise might have to do yourself and perhaps a little bit self-interested. Obviously, SAP is one of those as well, um, where if you run SAP landscape. SAP takes care of a lot of the you know, infrastructure operations, the you know, um, uh, resiliency of the landscape, the um, availability of power and water for data centers, capacity um, uh, that otherwise you also would have to do yourself on top of the user management and the security of the business processes. Right, right. Thank you for that. The next question is, is it right that resources in security now shrinking and the highest are shifted to low pay countries? I, well, not in SAP, like this might be something that is happening elsewhere in the industry, um, but um, the reality is, is that in, uh, SAP, we've been given the mission to strive for excellence in security. Um, that also means that we need to bring talent in um, where we can. And as I said, we'd like to bring in early and um, uh, provide them the uh, education, training and environment uh, to, to grow in. But I would certainly not um, assume that we're looking to like reduce cost by more junior resources or anything like that. I think that's a misunderstanding, even though I do recognize that, you know, in the industry, um, uh, wider industry, this might not necessarily be the case. Right. I also didn't uh, get any information uh, within a CP. So we are on the strong way of building up security and making it even stronger. We understand that security and compliance is really fundamental, uh, fundamental to the role exactly. that we play um, for our customers. And, and that is increasingly the case. Uh, there's one customer who, whose quote always keeps ringing in my head. Uh, that is, if it's not secure and compliant, this features behind it don't matter, right? Exactly. It's kind of table exactly. stakes. Uh, so um, we have to be diligent in always uh, looking for improvements in how we can do better. 
Right. There are uh, more questions in the chat. Um, we run our SAP systems on-premise and haven't made the migration to S4HANA yet. What do you recommend and uh, how you can help us? So uh, there's a couple of paths, of course. Uh, uh, first of all, in, if you haven't made the move yet and you haven't looked yet at some of our security portfolio or uh, the uh, ecosystem of partners that help you run your on-premise systems better, uh, I would certainly encourage you to do so, uh, especially in case where you have uh, many instances uh, running. Uh, they can be a enormous uh, assistance to help you navigate like which landscapes need to have which patches on um, to minimize any disruptions to operations. Obviously, I can only encourage people to move to uh, S4HANA. It is the um, next generation. Uh, uh, personally, um, as SAP employee, as someone who um, works hard on the uh, security of uh, um, SAP overall, uh, together with all my colleagues, we're happy to have you in the RISE program, but we also understand that you might um, make different choices. And again, uh, um, look at our uh, portfolio of securities and GFC services. To help you with that, look at our uh, partner ecosystem that can help you make that uh, transition. And I'm sure if you talk to your account um, manager, um, we can find you the right solution um, that suits your needs. Right. Thank you for this and especially bringing up the ecosystem because it's an essential part of a CP strategy. Right. To work very closely with our partners uh, to in order to serve the, our customers. So there is one more question in the chat. Uh, we have become multi-cloud and hybrid clouds through acquisitions and teams making their own decisions. Where do we start regaining control over that? So it seems like uh, a, a lot of things coming together, but everybody oper operates on its own. Yeah, this is something that is um, quite common. Like SAP, in fact, is um, unique that we consciously made the decisions to be multi-cloud and hybrid cloud. Um, I've only barely seen uh, that the case uh, with others where there was a real strategic or business decision to do so. Um, most organizations kind of stumble into it. Um, as a result, I would also say like whether you're multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, or even single cloud, um, if you haven't done it already, make sure that all of your cloud accounts are in um, a, a organization so wh where you can manage uh, all of those cloud accounts centrally. Uh, we have been extremely successful into um, doing that and centralizing billing and then cross-charging uh, cloud run cost uh, to those that are uh, using those particular cloud accounts. But what it allowed us to do is have central oversight, apply central policies that apply to all cloud accounts that are part of that you know, SAP organization and any of the cloud providers, um, as well as deploy security tooling and uh, collect logs manually, right? These are you know, mostly organizational things. Uh, that we're not even really talking about tooling here yet, and like a couple of smart people that can um, do some DevOps around that uh, is, of course, useful. But we're not talking about like, you know, SAP recommends me to buy this like massively expensive, you know, security tool or program or suite or anything like that. Like if, if you haven't yet done this uh, structuring of cloud accounts within uh, your cloud providers, organizations, and set policies on that, that is where I would immediately start. So everything else after that becomes technically easier. 
Right, thank you for that. Uh, the next question is, you mentioned ensuring vendors are secure by default and secure by design. How do you verify that? Or perhaps how would you suggest smaller orgs verify that? Uh, so first of all, make sure that you ask your supplier all the hard questions. Right, so this is essentially third party risk management. Uh, we do that with our own uh, suppliers. Um, we have a bit of a different problem with open source, of course, because there's not really somebody that you can talk to and instruct like, hey, you know, we want you to sign you uh, like a data privacy agreement or, or anything like that. Uh, so for that, we have our um, uh, open source program office, OSPO, uh, that navigates some of that, make sure that, you know, uh, licenses are checked and um, such. But when that software is brought into SAP solutions, it becomes part of our security scans, vulnerability management uh, programs, uh, security validation, etc. So that is harder to do if you are a smaller organization. Um, you may look for uh, places uh, that you know provide some guarantee around uh, open source uh, software that is used by large organizations. We do, don't do that, but you can find that from from others, or at the very least, go through like the you know, approved um, repositories or um, uh, uh, you know, things like uh, NPM and and uh, PIP and so on. But it is a challenge, right? Like, especially because every day new vulnerabilities get um, disclosed. Uh, so making sure that your software pipelines can accommodate change is probably the strongest advice that I could give you, uh, teams big or small, so that you don't get yourself like boxed into a long dependency chain that you know you can update because there's like this minor component somewhere that where the maintainer is just one guy, but everything everybody else is waiting for that update or your entire stack fails, right? So like a lot of the right decision making is what libraries do I use? You know, how many supporters are there behind it, right? Like Linux or Apache probably fairly safe, but like don't pick something so niche that has like, you know, two people behind it and one kind of doesn't want to anymore, right? So do your due diligence of um, you know, where does this come from? How many people are involved? Can you yourself be involved? Um, and if it's really important to you, you know, become a contributor or in whether that is in financial terms or uh, in terms of you know, supporting this with your own code pull requests and so on. Right, thank you for that. And the next one is not a question, but a great quote uh, from the partner saying the cybersecurity ecosystem is one of the best places to be in the SAP world and a really exciting time for us partners to work with SAP, never boring. So thanks Roland for bringing this up. I think it's a great uh, closing quote also to everyone in this, uh, in our audience who might be hesitating or thinking of whether it's the right uh, place to be or to move. So just um, look at this quote and uh, yeah, join, join us. It's a great place to be. So um, I can't see more questions in the chat. Uh, I think we are at the end of our session today. And as you are now well equipped with the information on how SAP approaches managing security risk, I can only recommend to check SAP's Trust Center uh, this is a valuable resource for all security and compliance related information. The link is in the chat and the link will also appear in a moment on your screen. 
With this, thank you, Jay, for your presentation. Thanks to our audience for being so active and bringing up all these questions. I wish you a great uh, morning, day, or evening, wherever you are. And with this, stay with us, stay tuned. Thank you, and bye-bye.